at praising God and being reminded of his incredible faithfulness, his goodness, his favor. We're going to talk about God's favor this morning and uh, tie it together with uh, this special weekend and even, uh, even for some of you that been around for a while, you're saying, what was the date, what was the time? Well, this is Anniversary Sunday, and uh, it's in your little handout, FBBC Anniversary Sunday, and uh, this Sunday, actually, Pastor Bobby is uh, preaching for uh, Rick Summers Church out in Lewisburg, Kansas. I just remembered, boom, bam, thank you, God, my memory's not completely gone. But it's their anniversary weekend as well, and Rick and Catherine are there, and a few others. Uh, they're celebrating also, too, besides their anniversary. The, the, I think they, uh, well, hey, they're not going to be listening to this right now, so pff, even if it blows a surprise, uh, they're going to surprise Rick Summers. Uh, 45 years of ministry that Pastor Rick Summers has been serving the Lord, so they're going to honor him and surprise him uh, today as well. Uh, and I believe that that church out there has been at least 25 years. I think this is their 25th, so thank you, God. We are celebrating our anniversary Sunday. We don't often do this except for maybe the 5th year, the 10th year, 15th, and on and on with all, the, all those type of uh, uh, landmarks. And uh, obviously very, very important. It's kind of like uh, all of you newlyweds, you know, you, you celebrate, you know, every, every, well, I hope you do. You celebrate like every year and every month and, oh, I'm so happy to be married to you. And then after about two or three years, you're going, when's our anniversary date? Uh, uh, don't do that, guys. Don't do it. Gals, don't do that either. But we are at a place of uh, this church at First Bible Baptist Church, 24 years this year. But you see in that slide that uh, uh, we are going to be celebrating the 25th year next year. And so I set aside this, this Sunday. Uh, is that doing it on its own? Are you playing around with me? That's okay. We, can, we have uh, uh, little squirrely things that happen now and then. That's me. Okay, there we go. Hey, look at that. Dun, 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 dun. There we go. But this Tuesday, May 4th, is actually the commission day for this church, 1997. This church was uh, started um, with a a vision from the Lord, man and his family that said we need to go out to eastern Jackson County and Blue Springs. And, and so the founding pastor, Rick Johnson, uh, came out here and had a band of uh, David's mighty men. Many men and women came along in the charter. I believe there was 66 people that signed it. And that was, of course, back then on May 4th, 2000, excuse me, 1997, 24 years ago. And now it's 20. 21, and uh, some of you were here around that time. Not many, but a few are still here, I believe, of course, the Clemens. And, and uh, how many of you were around at the very beginning of this church? Did you raise your hand? A few of you, cool, awesome. Some of you are a little bit younger at that time, like Michael and Sean and a few of you, but now here we are. And we're going to spend a little time praising God today and and seeing all that he has done and being reminded that, hey, one year from now, we're going to celebrate 25 years. And it's a, to me, that's a really, really important, important, important time. And so that's when you see up on the screen there, you say, hey, what is that little, well, that little 25th was at the top of that slide. But that is a little bit of artwork for us. We're already preparing uh, the 25th anniversary, 25 years of God's favor. And we're going to speak about that a little bit today. Why are we speaking of the 25th when we're just celebrating the 24th? It was kind of like all of you where you're having like your lunch and while you're in the middle of your lunch, you're planning your dinner. And that's kind of what we're doing here. I just figured I'd be culturally sensitive. That's true, you know. You know, how many of you were at breakfast this morning having like a breakfast burrito and a cup of coffee and go, boy, I can't wait for lunch today. Where are we going for lunch? How, what are we going to have for lunch? Where are we going today? We haven't even got out of the gate yet, and we're ready to go. Well, we're out of the gate for the 25th anniversary, meaning it'll take us a year to get there, and I'm going to share a few things for a few minutes here, and then 
uh, take you through a, uh, an Old Testament big picture study for a few minutes of God's favor in the Old Testament. We'll start out a little bit with a, uh, uh, someone that you're very familiar with. His name is Jesus Christ. Why don't you go to Luke 2, and you're going to meet me there here in a few minutes. And as you do that, I'm going to take you through some of the things that are going to go on here. And I'll run with this B for a little bit, and then you'll, you'll know to pick up. Thank you. The 25th anniversary. Wednesday, May 4, 2022. So, a year from Tuesday. Dun, 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 dun. So what are we going to do for that celebration, that time uh, where it is, again, a landmark and a, a very important time? Well, we're going to have a week-long celebration. Kind of like a feast. Like maybe a Passover feast or... Feast of the Tabernacles or something like that. But we're going to have a time all week long from Sunday to Sunday. Sunday is May 1, and, and then, of course, there's Sunday, May 8. I'm thinking, okay, which Sunday do we? I don't know which one. Uh, well, let's do both. And we'll even use Wednesday in the middle. What we're going to do is decorate the building throughout the year. And if you read my email that I sent out, and some of you that don't get them or things like that, let me give you a hint. It's really simple. If you don't get the church emails that I send out, you go to the website, you go down, and, and toward the bottom there, it says, uh, would like to get emails. Push the button. Subscribe. Put your email in. You say, well, I have opted out of those emails. You have to put yourself back in. So go ahead and do that. You say, well, I don't get the emails. Well, you might be getting them, but you put... Pastor Mark Brown's name in the junk folder. You need to get me out of there. Rescue me from the junk folder. Or some of you with a Gmail, you got the promotions and, oh my gosh, this email stuff. You got mail. I mean, how long ago was that? We have gone a little bit further. But our system is quite reliable and does well. And I actually, as I've shared in the past once or twice, I can be like Big Brother and I can track your email and go, I wonder if they're looking at it. And of course, when it's shown that it's open, it doesn't mean that you actually read it. It means that you went, oh, goodbye, Whoop, gone. Yeah, so I don't know what you're doing. It's okay. God knows, though, he's watching you when it comes to my emails, I tell you. One of the things I put in there was that you can be part of a lot of different things that are going to be going on. Decorate the building. There's a lot of decorating to be done. We had a really neat project in 20th anniversary times. We're going to go even further. We have lots to put up on the walls, fun pictures, lots of things. There'll be so much that we're going to do. And uh, please understand that we're going to put a team together and it'll be a large team of people that will plan it out, work it out. And uh, hey, it, I don't know. My thought is this, I'm going to get it kicked off and then everybody's going to go have a good time and then I'll, I'll show up in May and I hope everything went okay. No, but we're, we're going to be all right. We're going, we're going to have a good time together. We have a tremendous team of people and we'd love to add you to that team when we have the opportunity to put things out and you can click a button, just like VBSC. The email yesterday went out and at the bottom it was an opportunity to engage the mission with VBSC. Well, see, you missed out if you didn't read the email. Because you can be part of VBSC and be a servant there. I've got Mike Curtis. He's leading all the praise and worship. He's going to be bringing out a guitar, stuff like that. No, actually, no. We don't want to do that. But, but we, we already have some people sign up. But there is an opportunity through that email to click a button. You can do that. So we'll put a team together to do things. And as I mentioned, we'll have an anniversary worship service, a big one out in the sports park. We're going to use a sports park. Like we did 10 years ago, we'll get the biggest giganta tent we can find, and uh, we'll have a great time out there. And uh, if we can hold 800 to 1,000 people on the sports park right now, for soccer, we can handle 800 to 1,000. Well, what about child care? Bring your kids and let them scream. Let them have a good time. It's a celebration. We'll figure all that out, though. I'll leave that up to the planning team, and we'll figure those things out. But... It's going to be a big worship service on that Sunday. Anniversary dedication. We're going to have a Wednesday night dedication time. What do you mean? Well, already the church has been commissioned. People signed a charter, all that. We're not going to rededicate. What we're going to do is dedicate the next 25 years to the Lord. And we're going to get together and have an evening of dedicating things unto the Lord. Testimonies, 
singing praises to him in just a simple time of prayer, dedicating just as those group of Jewish worshipers did when the temple was finished by Solomon and they sang a song. And when you read that song, it just makes you cry to think of what they dedicated and committed to the Lord when they built that temple of worship. And then the following Sunday we'll have another worship service in here and kind of have the other bookend of our service time. It should be really, really a sweet time. You see, there's a lot that can go into this, and so we're, uh, and there's going to be, is that we're looking at in our 25th, uh, excuse me, 24th Sunday now, we're looking at already the 25th and being prepared for that. Uh, in the midst of all that, there's something that is kind of special, and there has to be some type of special thing, and this church has gotten behind many, many uh, projects over the years, giving to missions and missionaries, given to building projects, of course, uh, the buildings that we have, the land that we have, uh, everything from the Lord is, is incredible. We've talked about embrace this place and see all that God's done, and, and we'll, again, talk a little bit about that here in our message this morning. Uh, 25 years of God's favor puts me in a place and praying through this and getting together with uh, fellow pastors to say, uh, maybe it would be neat if we did a little something together and had a little project we did together that was, now it's hard for me. It's hard for me to do this. I, I, uh, well, let me ask you, how many of you have a really hard time when someone wants to show favor to you? They want to do something for you. How many of you have a hard time having people give you gifts and do things for you? Raise your hand. A lot. See, you have a hard time. Oh, it's tough to receive things. It's tough. Oh, don't, don't bother with me. But when someone says, hey, I want you to do something for someone else, you're, oh yeah, sign me up. I'll do whatever. That's the way we are sometimes. We just don't want anyone to lavish us with any gifts. Unless you're the wife of a guy that forgets your birthday, forgets Mother's Day, forgets the anniversary. For, you better get on it, buddy, because she wouldn't mind having a gift or two to be reminded that uh, she's put up with you all these years. But here we are with a project that, to me, lines up with our ministry. We haven't done uh, something like this in a long time. We're, uh, we're looking in this project to remodel the auditorium to do uh, a few little things here to, to uh, set it all up for the next bunch of years. And uh, what do you mean? We're going to take, knock the walls out and, and build new office buildings and all that? No, 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 no. That's a couple million dollars. What we want to do is replace the carpet. Now, many of you go like this all together. Oh, you're going to be so sad to see our carpet go, aren't you? How many of you have contributed to the stains? Don't raise your hands. We have a plan going where in order to make a couple of extra dollars toward the project, we're going to cut out pieces of squares where you spilt your drink. <laughs> we're going to have them framed and then put one of the little, little things on there dedicated to, you know, and there you go. You're all set. So you'll have your own little piece of carpet. We want to paint the walls the stage and the ceiling. This has only been painted twice. It's 20 years old almost. The last time the ceiling was painted was when it was painted by the builder. Builder grade paint back in 2002 in the spring. I believe it was March or April. The ceiling, eh, maybe a little earlier than that, it was shot and, and sprayed and uh, done. So uh, now I'm making you look up, aren't I? And you're going, oh gosh, why haven't you painted it sooner? It's disgusting. Well, it costs a lot of money to paint a ceiling and the walls and everything. We're going to have to contract that part out. Unless you want to volunteer with a two-inch cut-in brush and see if you can do this. You start now, you might be done by May next year. Modernize the stage and the lighting. We could not and no need, we don't believe, to do all the lights. We have looked at in the last three or four years maybe estimates of working on our lighting just because we just want to upgrade it. We're not looking for a super duper light show, even though Dwayne is looking at, you know, some of those like fireworks and stuff like that. <laughs> He's asking the Lord to make him the fireworks. So that's uh, but no, we we would like to just modernize the stage lighting. This stuff is all dated, it's 20 years, give or take, but a lot of things are older. When you update lighting, we're not gonna do all the lighting in the room. That they'll, they'll be fine. 
you have to have control boxes and modules, and there's a lot that goes into this. Just like, again, I've mentioned before, when you buy a car now, your car is filled with anywhere from 20 to 30, maybe more modules. They're not, oh, they're computers. It's a module system. It's a, uh, there's those modules and controllers and things like that that regulate your windows going up and all that. Well, the new lighting system, any type of lighting, and we'd like to do something again for the stage, not again for a show that puts any attention on man. I'm not about that. We, we don't do that. We, of course, worship and sing and praise and preach to give God the glory. But we need to update and upgrade if we're going to be able to use this gathering space for outreach, for anything further, for just Sunday mornings being able. We have a lot of little things that happen here. By the way, just a side note, we have fixed a lot of the can lights in terms of just making them work better. But they actually have like a little, uh, I, I can push a button. And just like zap them over here when you're falling asleep. So I'm watching you to see if you fall asleep. And yeah, like over here, if the light's messing with you, the Curtis is, I do, and your lights go like this, and then you go out like that, and then you're back and you're awake. And I'm going to miss that part of it when we update things. But that's something we'd like to be able to do, improve the sound system. We'd like to be able to do that. It is 20 years old as well. Just some upgrades. And, and again, as it says, modernize some things so that they'll last for another 20 years. Things have lasted 20 years. Thank you, God. And we're just looking at those type of things. As a building is 20 years old as well, that means the roof is 20 years old, all those other things are very old. So renew the chairs. These chairs are fine. Replacing them would be, to me, counterproductive. But being cleaned, reupholstered, help, you know, work on them a little bit. We can do that. There's places that all of us, that's a beautiful winter project. Don't you hear it, Colin? It's calling your name. January and February, repurposing, re, well, not repurposing, renewing the chairs because we're going to continue to use them in the auditorium. So that's part of that auditorium remodel. Our goal is to take up an offering May, June, July, and August from May 1 to September 1 is uh, what that's saying. What is the cost? Well, the carpet's going to cost twenty-five dollars to $30,000. There's a lot of carpeting here. It just costs money. And I've had general estimates. I had an estimate four or five, six years ago it was that kind of money. But the carpeting has to cover all the way through the back of the stage up through here and back around toward where the baptistry is because that's original. Um, and somebody that used to fill the baptistry all the time flooded the place a few times. So, you know, there you go. But that carpet's done well and handled it hang, hung in there. Painting. Painting will be 25 to 30, give or take, uh, depending on... Uh, when we get the bids and the stuff like that. But the, ha the reason the cost is painting the ceiling is a lot of money. There's a lot involved there. And we haven't painted the stage since uh, Pastor Brian uh, painted it, I think, 2013. So it's seven or eight years ago that we last painted it. And, of course, the lighting and the sound combined. Um, and we'll just see. This is on you and on us together. This is your church. Well, just go on the savings account. If we did, then all the money would be gone from the savings. I'd like for all of you to really pray through this. I will send out emails over the next couple of weeks. I will make sure that you have um, access and the ability to direct funds as you pray through it. I want you to pray through it. I want you to really pray through it. And if God's put it upon your heart already in the next week or two or three, that's fine. It's like any special offering. You can put it on the envelope and do that. Or if you give online, there's a little box that you can put in and designate the money. But I will put an emphasis on this as your pastor in a way that you can say, okay, um, how's it going? And, and what are we doing? And how much money came in? And I'm just praying through this that God will uh, supply the needs. And God does that according to his direction. He has directed us to do this. And again, in confirmation with our pastor saying, hey, doing a little something for the auditorium. These are just things that, it's just regular maintenance for your house. I don't know how often you paint your house, but this will be the third time we've painted in 20 years. So that's not bad. We've done pretty well. It'll be the first time we've done carpet since this was put in in the spring, uh, winter spring of 2002. So that's a long time. So those... That's before you. That's an opportunity for you to be part of this, to say, hey, I'd like to do something special. I'd like to do a little. I'd like to do a lot. Whatever it may be, we'll take that offering up through May, June, July, 
August before we'll, we'll take up all the monies and do it all before we even get to our missions time and our Acts 1A conference. So the 25th anniversary, again, the project is a part of it. But the project, of course, as we head into it, should be just a small part. The big part is really celebrating God and God's work in our church. And we every year look at Thanksgiving, giving thanks to the Lord for all that he has done through God's people. And sometimes, as I did two or three years ago, we, we did a little videos and things. And, and we'll do a lot, of course, for our 25th anniversary between today, the 24th, and the 25th to put all, all those big things together, the things that we see with our eyes. But beyond that, I believe we have to look in the Word of God and we also have to see the testimony of the Lord and understand that God's favor has been at work here for a long time. And we need to see that through our prayer time, through our conversations with our brothers and sisters, being part of ministry. When you, uh, if you could find a parking space to go out at the 17th season of Happy Five Soccer Club and, and just see another year of people being part of something that's way beyond themselves and to see God's kingdom work being done as we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. To come out and see yesterday afternoon, and I know that there was some, some ladies here that were here for four hours at, at least, maybe more, and they were working on beautification to <clears throat> improve uh, and just seasonally work on the presentation of our property. When you drive in the driveway and you come up and you go, wow, this place is so beautiful, but... Maybe sometimes you just drive in and go, ah, that's nice, this place is nice, and, and uh, we forget how much God has done. And I know this is the, the stuff that we see with our eyes, but I'd like you to consider this. God's favor for us on our location, and again, I probably say this once or twice a year, I, I want you to just kind of track into where we're headed today. God's favor on our location says this, our location makes a statement. It makes a statement to everyone that drives by. If you say that you go to that church up on the hill, they'll know what church it is. Yeah, First Bible Baptist is up there. It's a church up on the hill. That's a huge church. That's such a big church. No, it's, it's not that big. There's a lot of people there too. And Well, you have a really, really nice church. And as I often say, when did you meet somebody that goes to that church? Who, who did you meet? And they'll say, no, no, you just have a really nice church. And I'll say, no, you must have met someone. You must have met someone from that church in order for you to say that you have a great church. Well, no, they're talking about the location. And that's awesome, too. I heard a preacher down in Texas, uh, Dwayne would remember a man saying that. Say, boy, you having people come and say, you have a nice church. You say, well, who were you talking to about our church? I love that. I love that way of looking at it because you are the church. But our location here is beautiful, too. And it makes a statement that we're serious about God's stuff. We're serious about the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and if you have anybody say, what is it about that church? Well, they really love on people, and they tell people about the Lord. That's about what they'll say. I don't know if I want to have anything more than that, because that's the introductory step into all the other stuff. Well, they got the theology right, and they do things right, and they don't have, that, that's fine, but those, that's what people find out after a while. When they come to this location, they find out that there are people here that really, really love the Lord. They love others. And they want to say, hey, there must be something about your faith. So God's favor on our location makes a statement. Also, too, God's favor is on our purpose. And I see that in the purpose of the church. From the very beginning, we came out here about a year and a half. My wife and children and I, we came out uh, in the August of 1998. So this August, it'll be... 23 years, hard to believe that we've been out here this long. It's our home, and it's our, our, it's our, our place. It's our, I don't know, I'm a northeastern guy, and I'm not so sure that anyone would <laughs> say that I am a, a Midwesterner. I have a little bit of a, still of a northern and eastern way, but that doesn't matter. I know God's purpose for us when we came out here was to be part of what God was doing, to be trained up, to be sent out, whatever it may be, and here I am, and here we are together 23 years later, completely vested into God's work because it's his purpose. And Acts 1-8 church has a mission purpose. We have a missional purpose to fulfill what God's called us to, and God's favor on our purpose makes a difference. If his favor wasn't on this, then it would just be a regular old club 
I do not want to be part of a club. I do not want to pastor a club. We don't need to have a club of people. What we have is fellowship in the Holy Spirit of God. We come to preach the word of God. We exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. We declare his gospel to be life-changing and bring new life. And when God says, I give you favor, he says this. He says, you will be well favored by another. I will pour out my graciousness. I will pull out, pour out my preciousness, my pleasantness. When you see somebody that has favor from God, they are pleasant. They are precious. They are well favored. They do have this beauty about them that is spirit filled. That's the way that God, to me, has been working in this church and working in your lives. And we desire for him to keep on doing it because beyond our incredible statement of what God's done in our location and purpose, he also says, I have favor on your mission. God's favor on our mission means this. It's a testimony to people of what we're about. We're about something. We're about God's mission, about being that Acts 1-8 church again on mission and saying, hey, when that happened, when, when life completely changed for those apostles and the Holy Spirit of God came and then they were able to speak the gospel and the truth of Jesus Christ and the, the tongue that was appropriate to each person to hear. And then people got saved and they were baptized and the early church started. That was the testimony of God's supernatural power. That's God's favor. And God's favor on our mission means this. Very simply, we are doing that which he's called us to do. People receive that and they say, you have something from God. You have something that I don't see normally. That means that you are pleasant, agreeable. You are good in your approach, which means it's God's favor in you and in me. We're rich. We're valuable as we have an estimation of value in the Lord. That's God's favor. And it makes a testimony to other people when they say, hey, what about that church? What are they about? What are they doing? How is it? Well, I see God's favor on them. I see God doing something that I cannot explain other than to say that God has favor on their location, their purpose, and their mission, and lastly, on our vision. God's favor needs to be on our vision, or else it's just another plan for the corporate America. It's just another thing we're supposed to do. It's how to rebuild or build this or build that and, and be about the infrastructure well, we're about the spirit-filled person. We're about the word of God. We're about someone being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, being fully sanctified. And so God says, I will give you favor on your mission. But remember, our mission is one thing, but our vision is to make a heritage. It's the testimony of the mission, and it's the heritage of the vision that tells us that God's favor is upon us. We're looking at that all over the next year, 24th year to the 25th year. And we celebrate all that God's done because his favor makes a difference in our purpose. His favor makes a statement in our location. His favor says, testify. There's a testimony of God's presence in your mission and, of course, a heritage. How does that come to roost? Well, we have children and we have grandchildren and that heritage should be left, left behind because it's fruit that's been reproduced. It's discipleship. It's investment in others through the word of God. Hey, God's favor, if you really, really look around and see it, it's his kindness, it's his goodness, and it's his faithfulness. And we sung about that this morning. His faithfulness. He's always been faithful. He's never stopped being faithful. And that's part of his favor upon our vision it definitely makes a heritage when you think again about this 25th anniversary stuff and at the bottom of that artwork it says again i mentioned it earlier we're going to get into it for a little bit we're going to go to luke 2 years of god's favor there has been 25 years of god's favor and we see it together and we have to make a big deal out of it. Just like we make a big deal out of the Lord Jesus Christ. We make a big deal out of the Lord. And that's what I want to do just for the next few minutes. So follow along with me. We're going to grab a couple of little New Testament principles of favor. And then I said earlier we're going to do a, a, a 10 minute walk through. Big picture Bible study in 10 minutes. And then pull it all back together at the end. The first thing I see here in Luke 2.52 is this man named Jesus. He's a young boy. 
He is a child. And it says there, up on your screen, our premier example of God's favor is Jesus Christ as a young man. He's 12 years old, it says. He's only 12 in Luke chapter number 2. There is a Passover feast. The families are going into Jerusalem. They're getting together. It's going to be a big, big time. A bunch of families get together. They're coming together to worship. They're going back home now. And Jesus, of course, as the story goes, they've lost a counting of him. Then they go back, mom and dad, and they find Jesus Christ. Where is he found? He's found at the only place that he would be. He's about his father's business. And, of course, at 12 years old, as a child, he tarried back in Jerusalem. He's sitting there, and he's basically having uh, a schooling session with the scholars of the Jewish religion, all the ones that know so much. And it says in Luke 2.52, it's up on the screen. You can also follow along with your Bibles. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So here we are thinking, okay, this is Jesus at 12 years old. And he increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Why is that so significant? Well, his increase in all of that is to a place of maybe son of man more than son of God. But don't forget, he's about to take off from the year of 12 years old till 30, which we don't have a whole lot of anything in the Bible. But once he hits 30, baptism is public testimony. God the Father speaks, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then Jesus is off into the wilderness. And he's off to be tempted by Satan. And we find in Luke 4 where, that he's being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jer Jordan, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus Christ is full of the Holy Ghost, and he's being led by the Holy Ghost why? Because he's God, man, and he's man, God. And so this statement here is a real important defining moment. Because Jesus is just a young boy. But he's going to be set out to be a man. And all the development and work that's going to happen now, it's more of a divine work that God's doing in him. Not necessarily just the flesh work that would be done in a young boy. Because Jesus' power, we have to be reminded, of course, came from the Godhead, from the Father and the Spirit, together with the Son. You know what? Sometimes we think that we can just, like I said, just uh, stir up something or manufacture something and then say, okay, God, how does that look to you? And God's saying, wait a minute, all those natural attributes that you had, just like Jesus had natural attributes, they increased Wisdom, stature, favor with God, and then it became divine God, divine Jesus. It says in verse number 40, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and what? The grace of God. The grace of God was upon him. This is Jesus. He's God, son of God. And yet, he had the grace of God upon him. He had favor before God and from God and from man. Help me. Get it. Understand that you do not somehow embrace really who Jesus Christ was in this incredible statement. This boy is called out to be man, and now he's going to be divinely God, divinely man. He's sinless from birth, sinless all of his life, but he grew in body, and he grew in, to be a strong mind. He was filled with wisdom. He lived in God's grace. He had the gift of teaching at a young age. He knew his life mission. He was a model boy, it says in verse number 51. He increased in wisdom, maturity, and favor of God. This is Jesus. This is our premier example, our exemplary example of what it means to have favor. Another quick example is in Luke chapter number 1. Her name is Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus, found favor in the sight of God. And we, of course, know that. We look at that, we read that in the Christmas story and then forget all about it. Do you understand deeply what's happened here? That this woman... As she pondered things that are going on in her heart, she, there's a lot that goes on here with Mary and the story of her. And I'm not, again, exalting Mary like some religion might do. I'm just telling to you straight, God says, hey, you are highly favored. Verse number 28, chapter number 1, the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Again, the favor would be just for man if everybody said, hey, she's a good girl. She's a nice girl. No, no. She was highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Both ways it's working. She had the favor from the Lord. She showed favor to the Lord. The Lord is with her. 
That's the way that we want to have our testimony in God's favor on our mission. That our mission makes a testimony that we have favor from the Lord, but we also give the Lord the favor. We return back all of that. It says in verse number 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. I heard there was a man in the Old Testament by the name of Noah who found favor, found grace from the Lord. And the Lord then kept him and his family and saved them by the ark. You see the picture of God's incredible grace because right up there on that statement, 25 years of God's favor. 25 years of God pouring out things that are unmerited, that could not be earned. They're bits and pieces of how we found favor from God. We have favor in the sight of others because of God. We are in favor like Samuel was in favor, like Daniel in favor. He was brought into favor by God. You see, there's so much here about the favor of God. And so, you ready now? Okay. Lock in here. You follow along with me now. All of you know all your Old Testament heroes, right? All your Old Testament characters. So I'm going to have the verse up there, but I might use some other verses in that context. But we're going to start with Abraham. We've got to start with Father Abraham. We have been using him a little bit in our study in Galatians. And we'll go Abraham all the way down to Nehemiah. And we'll see God's favor from the Word of God. And how now the favor kind of slows down a little bit. The book of Malachi, I mean, well, he's an Italian prophet. The book of Malachi finishes out, and now 400 plus years, no witness, no witness of the favor of God upon anybody. Silence until Jesus shows up. So here's our first guy. His name is Abraham. God's favor. What did that mean for Abraham? What did it mean for that guy? Oh, Father Abraham and all the things. He had God's favor, but here's the context of what we're looking at in Genesis chapter number 18. He's visited by someone. His name is God and his angels. And it says there in verse number one of Genesis 18, and the Lord appeared to him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lift up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him, and when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Why? Because he knew who it was. It says up there in the screen, and said, my Lord, if, I, if now I have found favor in thy sight, which he knows about the promise now, but now he's saying, hey, if I found favor now, this is what's going to happen in thy sight. Pass not away. Please don't leave. I pray thee from thy servant. Please today, this is the moment. This is the time. And then he rose off and he, and he goes and gets his wife. He says, put a meal together. Go kill a calf. We're, we're going we're to feed these godly men because there are Spiritual beings, angels that have been sent with the presence of God right there. And of course, God doesn't need any bodyguards, but he's got a couple with him. You see, this is powerful because the covenant is confirmed in this moment. And he, again, Abraham saying, I pray thee that I have found favor in thy sight. What a great way to go. <laughs> That's the way to go. That's what I like about hearing what Abraham was asking for. If I found favor in your sight. The next guy up there, here continues your big picture Bible study, God's favor. What did that mean for Joseph? You know Joseph? The Bible says in Genesis chapter number 39, I believe I got that, screen, that one up on the screen right there. It says, hey, Joseph, the Lord was with him and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So what do we got? We've got a situation where Joseph, of course, has been thrown in prison. He's been neglected and rejected by his brothers. They want to get rid of him. And he's been sent to prison. And Joseph ends up what? He's a goodly person. It says in verse number 6 of Genesis 39, Joseph was a goodly person and he was well favored in the prison. He was well looked at from God because, uh, from those because from God he had favor. And when you look at that verse, you're going, wow. The Lord was with Joseph, showed him mercy. The Lord gave the favor in the sight of the other people. God can give favor for you in the eyes of another person. That's what I love to see. Because then there's no explanation other than God. This is in Acts chapter number 7. 
in the account, of course, in the preaching message of the recounting of how God dealt with the Jews, it's another reminder of how Joseph was, again, put in a position of God's favor. It says in verse number 9, before that verse up on the screen, and the patriarchs moved with envy. They sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. But God was with him. But God was with him. You know that phrase, you want to have a great Bible study? Look at those places in the Bible when you see where God was with somebody, the Lord was with somebody. Because verse 10 says, right up on there, and delivered him out of his afflictions, gave him favor, gave him favor, gave him favor. He gave him wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. That's what God does, but God was with him. Next guy. Here we go. What did this favor of God mean to Moses? Ah, oh, Moses. We know in Exodus chapter number 3, he's battling himself. He's battling the command. He's battling the orders from God. He's saying, I can't do this. I can't speak. I can't do this. And God says, hey, I'm going to send you, and I'm going to bring out stuff upon this nation like you've never seen before. And I'm using you as the prophet and the teacher and the speaker. I will get Aaron next to you. I'll take care of all your problems. It says in Genesis chapter number 3, and if you picked it up in 15, it would say that God said, Moreover unto Moses, thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. So that's the context of how God's getting a hold of Moses. But he goes down in verse number 21, and he says this. I'm going to free you people. I'm going to use you. We're going to be, you're going to be freed. And it says in Exodus 3.21, And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when you go, you shall not go empty. Think about that. They were in slavery for over 400 years, making the brick. And then when they leave Egypt, they have favor from the Egyptians, and they hand them all that they need to get by. That's messed up. But only God can do that. When God sent this church out and got this church planted, he has supplied everything that you could possibly need. The land that came from Egypt, the ability to buy it, all those things. And it says in verse number 22 of Exodus 3, But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor, and of her that sojourneth in her house, jewels of silver, jewels of gold, and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. <laughs> That's God's favor. You get so much more. God take, when you think God can't do anything, God takes care of things. That's through the life of Moses. And that's in the beginning of Moses' ministry of leading those people. God gave favor to those Jews as they left the Egyptians. Powerful. Hey, what about Ruth? I think she's next up there. God's favor. What did that mean for Ruth? The Bible says in Ruth chapter number 1 that she clave, Ruth clave to her mom-in-law. As a Moabitess, she, of course, has no one to be with. She's lost her husband. She has nowhere to go. The story of Ruth is so powerful. And we know that what it does say about the character of this woman comes in Ruth chapter number 1, where she says, For whither thou goest, mom-in-law, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. And so she goes with her, and now she shows up in this land, in this field that she needs to glean stuff from, uh, uh, the, the crops from and glean. The, uh, my mind is frozen. That's okay. And she's in a position where she's looking to Boaz, who is the lord of the land, who's the next, is the near kinsman of her husband, her family, to be able to say, hey, I just, I just need something here. And it says in, uh, in Ruth chapter number 2, verse number 13, then she said, in this setting where she's out in the field, she just wants to do some harvest. And Boaz says unto Ruth, hey, uh, what are you doing here? What are you here for? Uh, and I'm going to take care of you. Now I know why you're here. And, and I'm going I'm to be a picture of what the Lord can do for you. And she says, let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me. And for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thy handmaids. Think about God's favor again. 25 years of God's favor on this church. 
on your life, on this ministry. Think of what happens when you step outside of that favor, when you step outside of the local church and the local gathering, when we step out of God's family, God's government and what he's got put in place, God's church. We end up really wondering why nothing that's lined up with favor and grace from God happens. Well, we need to take the opposite side of the way to do things like Ruth and say, hey, I'm submitting myself, Lord. Hey, could I, I, I just want to grab some favor from you. I just want to get a little something. He says, hey, I, as, as Ruth said in verse number 10, I have found grace in thy eyes. Why? Why? I'm just a stranger. And you just stop and say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Why have I found grace in thy eyes? Thank you, God. That's all you say. When you ask that question, don't expect an answer. You don't need to have one. It's just God's favor. What about the next one? I heard this guy named Samuel. What did this favor mean to Samuel? Of course, Samuel, very simply put, and we have this in, in our uh, little baby dedication time, it says in 1 Samuel chapter number 2 that the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with, child, excuse me, with the Lord and also with men. Think of this, when you put things in the proper place and the way that you have a children's ministry, a youth ministry, your families, your children are in a good place here. I just want you to know that. Because of God's favor, God working through people, God bringing wonderful servants. And if you're part of that next part that's supposed to be in God's favor to be serving in children's ministry, then you need to say yes and do that because these children, Samuel, they grow up. And what was his calling? He was a prophet. The child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. That man as a child, they knew who he was. He was God's anointed child. And he was God's anointed man. And he had favor from the Lord. And when you look at certain children and you look at different things, you go, we better put them in a position where they can grow beyond just being just this little kid in the world and, and just going to high school and having a nice life. They may be God's favored child. What are we doing as a church to ensure that that happens? We need to put those things in place. And God has done that. And God has used incredible things of his favor in order to ensure children to have an incredible opportunity to follow the Lord. What about David? I'm not going to go into the, the lineage of David and his kingship, but think of him as a child, as a young teenager. He was called out, of course, by his father Jesse because Jesse was told by King Saul, hey, go get your son over here. He can play some music for me. So it's in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter number 16. Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. How did that happen? Because Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, my son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse, it says there, went out to his son and said, Hey, son, you need to go to Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly and became his armor bearer. Powerful stuff, guys. Well, it didn't always go that way. But here's where we are. we are. In God's favor, when God says here, I'm going to extend favor upon you, David, to do that which I've called you to do, the person that is against you, that you love greatly, is seen to have favor for you that had to come from the Lord. Because Saul in his own flesh was a jealous, envious man. But he saw from God and put David in a place where, hey, he hath found favor in my sight. That's God. That has to be. Because it hasn't, it isn't. When somebody's flesh looks at somebody and says, I see everything that's wrong with you. I see everything that's missing in you. I don't see God in you. I see that church doesn't do this. I see that church doesn't do that. But when I hear people say, I hear that those church people do this, that they care for this, that they extend love and grace, that they do that for people, I know that's beautiful God's favor. And that's the testimony of us in his mission and how he has given us great confirmation in that. A couple, two or three more and we're done. Daniel, we're near the end of all of those in the Old Testament that God proclaimed favor on. What did the favor of God mean to Daniel? Very simply, chapter number one of Daniel's 
uh, writing, we see here, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. He runs into this place, the Babylonian um Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire that he is part of. These Jewish kids have been thrown in to the fray because they're going after the best kids so that they can prove that their way, the way of the, the tongue of the Chaldeans is the way to go. And of course, they have God's favor upon them, these children. And it says, calling out specifically Daniel, now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. That's what happens in a church. You look around and you go, wow, God just pushed out a little bit extra favor there and a little bit extra fa favor there. God can do whatever he wants. And Daniel had this favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs, the one that was sent to oversee him from this Babylonian empire. What did God's favor mean to Daniel? It put him in a place where he could continue to follow and carry out God's incredibly strong work in his life. Esther, we're getting near the end. God's favor in Esther. Don't forget Esther. We can't forget her. She is put in a position where Ahasuerus is looking for another queen. And she need, he needed to be appeased. He remembered Vashti and what she had done and what decree was against her. He said, of course, then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, let there be a fair young virgins sought for the king. And so they went through, of course, the whole process of finding someone favorable to the king. And it says in Esther chapter number 2, verse number 15, up on the screen, there's lots to be covered. We'll just leave you with that little study in, in Esther 2. Now when the turn of, the, of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken, for her, taken her for his daughter, was coming to the king, she required nothing, nothing to be added, but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women appointed, no extras, nothing, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. We know that through this powerful, incredible favor of God, that we know that the nation of Israel, the Jews, were saved. Of course, verse number 16 goes into verse number 17. And the king loved Esther above all women, and she obtained grace and favor. She obtained it. Wow, when you obtain something, you take it away, you bury, uh, bear it, you carry it, you sustain it. She obtained grace and favor from the Lord in his sight more than all the virgins so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. What a powerful, powerful Powerful statement of God. What an incredible story of God's amazing favor. And lastly, our last guy that we're looking at here. Some gals and some guys in the Old Testament. God's favor, what did that mean to Nehemiah? What did it mean to Nehemiah? He was a leader of leaders. But yet he had a burden. He was a prayer warrior. He was a man of prayer. And when you study the book of Nehemiah, we did a Bible study on it last year and stuff like that. And, and looking at just his leadership principles, this man had a burden for revival in his people. What did this God favor stuff do for him? Well, it tells me that he was being set apart to God's work. And it says in Nehemiah 2, verse 5, you know the principle, many of you. And I said unto the king, if it please the king, if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me into Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. What can be said about a man who desires revival of God's people? And maybe that's what God would have more than anything else beyond a project in the auditorium. Maybe God's people would see that God's favor is so powerful and so strong. Just like when Nehemiah went to his boss, the king, and said, Hey, can you release me from my obligations so that I can be part of building this wall? I've been praying over this and praying over this. Of course, if we go to Nehemiah chapter 1, two, you see so many powerful, incredible prayers of Nehemiah. And you realize that this man... Received grace and favor from God. But beyond that, he was a man that said, hey, I want to see revival in the hearts of your people. Please, God, show favor. God's favor, 
as I finish up, what does it mean for First Bible Baptist Church? This is for you to bring it all around, all those examples in the Old Testament, the example of Jesus Christ and having favor, having, of course, Mary. Now here we are, God's favor. What does that mean for you? But first, what's that mean corporately and collectively as a church? What does it mean for this church? What does God's favor mean to you? God's favor on our location and our purpose and our mission and our vision. What does that mean to you? As I look in the scriptures and I, I wonder about all the things that God has put before us and the responsibilities to whom much is given, much is required, I'm reminded of Acts 2.47 praising God and having favor with all the people, praising God and having favor with all the people, the Acts 2 project, and the Lord added to the church daily as should be saved. Oh my, praising God for us as a church looking around collectively and going, look at what God has done, not necessarily just in the buildings, but it's incredible. They're magnificent. It's more in the people and what God's taking us through the Bible teaching that goes on, the prayer that goes on, the desire for people to be sanctified, fit for the master's use, the things that go on in ministry and people serving, and on and on it goes, praising God and having favor with all the people, period. And then God says, he added to the church daily such as should be saved. What does God's favor mean to the church collectively is one thing, but the last thing is, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? What does it mean? Does it mean that I'm going to go out and do something special for God because of his favor? That's fine. Does it mean that maybe I can give a special gift to the project? Hallelujah. But to me today, just, I just want us to start right now for one whole year praising God. Just praise him. Just praise him. What a great place to start to have our heart kind of rejoice a little bit. Praising God for what he has done. How about praising him this morning in our time of invitation? Our Father in heaven, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, praising your name. We're praising you, God. We're ing We're We're continuing. We're doing it right now. We didn't just do it in the past. We're not going to do it in the future. We're praising you, God, right now. And as we come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain, to obtain mercy and find grace in our time of need, we thank you for your favor on this church. In this invitation time, I pray that you will put upon our hearts the need for us to start on baseline zero and just praise you. Praising comes from us opening our mouths, but being vocal to you, singing, telling you, declaring to you, giving you glory and honor. So that's what we desire to do this morning in this next minute or two or three as we have an invitation, I pray again for God's people that you, God, would work in them, both the willing to do of your good pleasure, and as we respond, you will hear our praises and open your heart with more favor on this church, we pray in Jesus' name. Everybody stand, and as the music plays, please come and spend some time praising God. Please come.